Well, once again, welcome back. This is our second half of uh, today's event, and we're going to move right along and get into our next speaker. When I got a chance to look at our next presenter's resume, I didn't have to go any further, actually, than my MP3 player. I started scrolling down, and I could uh, listen to some Queen Latifah, MC Light, De La Soul. I realized I was dating myself and telling everyone exactly how old I was with all of those pieces, but that's what's in my MP3 player. And our next presenter is one man who has basically placed his mark all over the world of music, including on the artists that I just named. And today, for TEDx Peachtree, he's going to present on the topic of what if hip hop was measured from a global perspective. So I'm going to ask you to give a TEDx Peachtree welcome to Daddy O. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'd like to uh, thank TEDx Peachtree for having me. Uh, it's definitely an honor and kind of like a dream come true. So um, big props to my man Al Myers for bringing me out. Um, so by the title of, of my lecture, I, I already expected security to be exiting me out by now um, because we know that some of the connotations that hip hop has had uh, over the years have really been, you know, it's, it's, it's basically uh, left a bad taste in our mouths. Um, let me tell you why I'm here. Um, I was born in 1961 on the mean streets of Brooklyn. Uh, I grew up in a different kind of Brooklyn. I grew up in a Brooklyn where uh, there were a lot of street vendors, there were uh, there was nationalities of, of, of every type, and I actually did grow up on welfare, but I grew up on a different kind of welfare. The kind of welfare that I grew up on was a welfare where you didn't have uh, EBT cards or food stamps, but you literally as a family had to get your monthly ration of food from a community center, and if you were late, then you just didn't get fed. Um, this can is actually the food, the milk that we used to get from those rations, so we, we had to be on time and we didn't even get uh, real milk. Uh, my introduction to violence uh, came at a very early age, uh, definitely living in Brooklyn, seeing um, stick up kids, number runners, pimps, pushers, you name it. Uh, but more importantly, about 11 years old, I actually saw a man's throat get cut from ear to ear. Uh, I saw the blood come down his chest like tomato paste. Um, the sad part is that my auntie and I had to actually patch him up, take a wet towel, hold him together um, before the ambulance came, clean the blood up. Tough part, culprit was my mom. Come to find out he threatened her. But it's all good. He didn't press charges. He loved my mom until she passed on. But I just wanted to let you know that I'm not a stranger to violence. Uh, as far as hip hop is concerned, uh, in about 1979, I started rapping. I put together a group called Stetson Sonic. We was deemed the original hip hop band. Uh, we went on to do some really good things, uh, most notably, or one of the most notable things that we did is we did a record in 1988 with a bunch of other rappers called the Stop the Violence Movement. We did a record called Self Destruction and we gave the, the proceeds to the Urban League. Uh, we actually did it because there was a young man that got killed in a nightclub that we all used to perform in and we wanted to make sure that people understood that it wasn't the music that actually got him killed. Um, when we speak about hip hop, or when I speak about hip hop, I, I, I'm, it's kind of a lesson within itself. A, a lot of you may think rap and hip hop is the same thing. I want to kind of be maybe the first person to tell you that it's not. Um, hip hop is actually a culture formed out of the Bronx, and there's four elements of hip hop where the rap is only one. So you have the DJ, you have graffiti art, and you also have b-boys or, or dancing. And this was a culture that was actually born out of kids in the Bronx that were fighting. There was a bunch of gang violence going on all over the place. These kids are fighting and killing each other. And so they decided that um, they didn't want to die anymore. They didn't want to fight anymore. So what they ended up doing is they ended up uh, forming a worldwide truce amongst these, um, uh, amongst these gangs. They, they, they had a truce. And out of that truce came this form of dance that they borrowed from Brazil, that they probably borrowed from somewhere in Africa, and, and what they did with these dances is that they, they literally uh, danced against each other the same way they used to battle each other with sticks and knives and guns, they actually began to dance against each other. So just keep in mind that with hip hop, we're talking about dance, 
we're talking about the graffiti art, we're talking about the DJ, and we're talking about the rapper, which actually the rapper actually came last. Now, your, your, your implication in hip hop now may be, you know, you might see a, a US postal stamp, or you might see Diddy hanging out with Trump. I mean, you know, th this is, this is what, what hip hop is for you. For me, um, international hip hop, which is the title of uh, what I want to talk about in my talk, actually looks a whole lot about uh, like the hip hop that I grew up with. On, 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 on the left side here, we have a super crew from France, and on the right side, we have the Cold Crush Brothers in 1981 from the Bronx, and they, they, they have a lot of similarities. I want to take you a little trip down memory lane, and, and we'll pick up in a minute. Before the time of hip hop, government approved policies and record unemployment in New York City left an entire class to fend for itself. The economically ravaged wastelands gave rise to a new breed of violent gangs. As the optimism of the civil rights movement faded, politicized groups like the Black Panthers and Young Lords gave way to a new street aesthetic, one that was inspired by the outlaw biker culture of the Hells Angels. This was the dawn of a new era for New York City street gangs. Fox, the Savage Girls, and further down by Steppens Avenue, the Ghetto Brothers, Black Pearls, those birds, and our whole kingdom, <laughs> Black Spade areas. Savage space. You know, nobody messing with Little Vietnam. By 1971, the city was ripped apart by continual turf wars. The Ghetto Brothers, one of the larger and more politically minded cliques, mobilized to work toward peace and unity in the streets. I want people to say the Ghetto Brothers has done something. I want my child to say when he grows up, well, my father's done something for society. See? And I want things to change, man, because I don't want to be living in the South Bronx where everything is messed up. Just when the city was on the brink of total war, a legendary treaty was created. President Young Sinners. Vice President of Young Sinners. Vice President Young Saints. President of Young Copas. War Council of Young Saints. Hundreds of gangs were unified, and a grassroots culture was born. This would become the earliest voice of the hip-hop generation, as turf wars eventually evolved into peaceful block parties. As turf wars eventually evolved into peaceful block parties. Um, so what does this have to do with international hip-hop? Um, what, what I want to show you, and what I want to explain here, is some of the effects that hip hop has had on the world at large and not just in the Americas. International hip hop has a, a very different face. Uh, these kids in these countries found that they could no longer express themselves with their parents' music. That's no disrespect to any traditional music. But when they heard this beat, this rhythm, um, the things that were coming out of these kids from the Bronx and then other parts of New York and then it spread to LA, uh, they knew that there was something in that that would allow them to express the way they really felt inside. Very interestingly, um, that meant problems, that also meant woes, and that also meant victory. So the face of international hip hop, it looks like this. It looks like that. It looks like that. It even looks like that. Okay, it works. So um, I just want to introduce you to some of the players in international hip hop and just kind of give you a, a bead on where this is going. Uh, this is Baba Mall. Even though Baba Mall is not young, but look at the way that he uses rap and, and hip hop. Uh, okay. He says, Yeah, yo, these deprived, forgotten, marginalized quarters. People are dying here of hunger. Yeah, yo, but rap is there. It's everywhere in our community because it's ours. Because it's the only way we have to tell each other 
what's going on in these marginalized quarters. I remember early in my career, in about 1989, I heard Chuck D from Public Enemy say that uh, rap was the CNN of, of, of America. Um, I, I'm, I'm actually, I'm gonna retract his statement and put it back out, that rap is the CNN of the world. Uh, you take a man, Tadalu, who is who, who's actually from uh, another place, he's from Persia, and look what he says, he says, oh, I feel good, uh, everything I do is fantastic, I have such a good life and a good time, even though my pockets are empty. Uh, these kids are beginning to express the way they really feel. It's not the traditional dance music of their parents. It's not the traditional um, um, political music of their parents, but more important, the things that are coming out of their heart. I think Emmanuel Jao for Sudan is, is one of the greater examples. I mean, this guy is huge beyond being a, a big rapper and, and having hit records. This guy's been on USA Today and he's been on CNN. Uh, he's actually got a, a biography and, and they actually made a book from what he was doing. Um, look at what he says. He says, my father was working for the government as a policeman. A few years later, a hardy joined a rebel movement that was formed to fight for freedom. I didn't understand the politics behind all this because I was only a child. And after a while, I saw the tension rising high between the Christian and the Muslim regime. We lost our possession. My mother's mothers suffered depression. And because of this, I was forced to be a war child. He says, I'm a war child. I'm a war child. I believed I've survived for a reason to tell my story to touch lives, touch lives, touch lives, touch lives, and touch lives. Sorry about that. So the question of the day is, is, is what if hip hop was measured globally? Uh, the, the first thing I'm going to ask you to do, it's going gonna, it's gonna to involve a shift in your thinking. It's the same kind of shift in your thinking that you do when you become a vegetarian or when you uh, decide that you know that the ozone layer is suffering or when you uh, go green. Uh, same, same type of shift that would have in, in your mind. And, and before I leave, I just want to give you my defense for this culture that I think in, in America has taken like a really bad hit. So I want to start off by saying that, and start by giving you these three jewels. Of, this is what I call the three jewels of global hip hop. Uh, three things to keep in mind. One is that hip hop as a culture has an anti-violent origin. This is a culture that these kids wanted to stop gang fighting and they found other ways to express themselves. Number two is that hip hop, even today, and, and has always been the voice of the people, but not only the voice of the people, also the voice of the martyr. These are people who literally die for their causes and they're actually using hip hop, rap music, graffiti, break dance art, G DJing, all of these particular things to express themselves. And then finally, that even now, on today in 2009, there is a continuous effort toward freedom, justice, and equality. And that's not only internationally, it's also happening in the Americas. And uh, we, we take it very seriously. Um, and a few of us have had a lot to say about it over the years. So before I leave, um, I just want to give you a piece of what I said about it. I mean, this is something I wrote in 89. But I think that it's, it's, it's relevant here. Um, here's how it started. Heard you on the radio. Talking about rap, saying all that crap about how we sample, giving examples. Think we'll let you get away with that? You criticized our method on how we make records. You said it wasn't art, so now we're going to rip you apart. Thank you. Daddy, before I let you walk away, can, can I we want to ask just a follow-up question there. And that, that is about the, uh, what we see in hip-hop culture today, obviously certainly glorifying more of the violent side, which you said is not the origin of the culture at all. What steps are being taken now internationally, domestically, to overcome that? Well, I, I look at it as, as a natural evolution. I mean, I've been involved in the culture 
Like I said, I started rapping in 79. So um, the way I describe it is this. If you look at this stage, a lot of people, when they look at the world, but let's just talk about hip hop. A lot of people, when they look at hip hop, they kind of think, if this is the beginning, they think we're here. We're really here. <laughs> so when you begin to start talking about steps, um, it, it's really going to be an a, a natural evolution. I, I, one of the things that I do want to mention is that a lot of people don't take in account numbers, just pure numbers. Um, it, it's facetious, but I, I use this example. When we started rapping, it was only five of us, right? So of course that was going to be phenomenally and incredibly pure and all of that. But as, as the numbers increase, um, as we would say on the street, the whackness increases too. <laughs> okay. All right. Enough said. Thank you. Daddy-o.